forebear's importance to painters and sculptor is evident to this day. Both George Catlin and Carl Bodmer painted forebears. Catlin's diaries describe him as an extraordinary man, free, generous, elegant, gentle, manly, and brave. Approaching Catlin to pose for a painting, Catlin wrote, no tragedian ever trod upon a stage or gladiator enter the Roman Forum with more grace and manly dignity. This is a drawing Catlin did of himself, painting perhaps the noblest, most gifted chief of the entire northern tribes. Bodmer painted many portraits, including forebears, painted a year earlier by Catlin. Bodmer was equally impressed with forebears. Inspired by Catlin's painting, Dave McGarry presents forebears at a time when the upper Missouri tribes had not yet had extensive exposure to the white traders in trade goods, as seen by the use of quill work instead of beads in his tunic, leggings, and moccasins. Forebears was given his name after defeating an Assiniboine chief in battle and being described as fighting like four bears. This version by Bodmer differs a little bit. The sculptor John Coleman has studied both of these pioneer artists of the West and chose this as his inspiration for his version of four bears. As Coleman has said, life and ambition sometimes collide. It's called responsibility. He worked as a contractor while learning to sculpt in the evenings. He began devoting full time to sculpting in 1994 at 45 years old. He hasn't looked back since. He's seen here in his Prescott, Arizona studio with a monument sized work behind him. As with many stories of the struggle to settle the West, this one has a tragic but not unfamiliar ending. Carl Bodmer was the last North American white man to see four bears alive. A group of French Canadian trappers aboard a riverboat approached the Mandan village with the body of a dead companion wrapped in a blanket. He had died of smallpox and was left ashore. The Mandans took the infected blanket. In 1837, the Mandan tribe was estimated at 1,600 in number. In three days, it was reduced to less than 150. Four bears died, but shortly before, on July 30, addressing the sick but remaining Mandans, quote, Ever since I can remember, I have loved the whites. I have lived with them. I have never wronged a white man. I never saw a white man hungry I gave him to eat, drink, and buffalo skin to sleep on in time of need. I was always ready to die for them. I pronounce them to be a set of black-hearted dogs. They have deceived me. Them that I always considered as my brother has turned out to be my worst enemy. The first thing I can remember is my father telling me about war. The old people constantly talked about war. That was the school in which I was brought up, the war school. If an Indian wanted to win distinction, he must be a good man as well as a good fighter. Chief Apache John, 1914. The boy learns from the tribal elders, constant detail, and repetitive stories shape his character. Play takes the form of mock hunting and war raids with small bows and other weapons to play with. Here is a Sioux boy in 1880 playing at being a warrior. His first responsibility is to care and feed the highly prized horses of his tribe. After the boy learns to respect horses, he is given his own horse. After intense training with his horse, he is now ready to join his first raiding party to steal horses from his enemy. 
If one of his tribe is killed, a war party is formed. There will be retaliation. As we know, Indian boys were taught to be warriors. At 10 years old, one such boy was in a fight with an older and larger boy. He defeated him, but the blood on his face resembled rain. They named him Rain in the Face. Thereafter, simply Rain. He did not have war chiefs in his family, thus had to be especially fierce to be a war chief of the Hunk Papa Sioux. Rain was a participant in a masterful ambush later called the Fetterman Massacre. A detachment of 81 troopers were dispatched from Fort Kearney, Wyoming to protect travelers on the Bozeman Trail. This was late 1866, a decade before Little Bighorn. A mixed tribe raiding party of Lakota, Cheyenne, and Arapaho taunted the inexperienced Captain Fetterman into chasing them into an ambush where all 81 were killed and, as was the practice, their bodies mutilated. This was the largest single engagement loss of the U.S. Cavalry up to that point. In 1868, the Second Treaty of Fort Laramie granted the Northern Plains Indians exclusive ownership of the Dakota Territory, 60 million acres of land. Broken promises, refusals on the government's part to restrain settlers and miners from encroaching on Indian territory caused constant friction and confrontation. The tribes would frequently leave their ever-shrinking reservation land. Dave McGarry has approached Rain in the face, in an unexpected posture. He is seated. His figure is draped with his hide rope decorated with images of his many deeds. He holds his rifle in a leather sheath. His high rank as a war chief among the Hunk Papa Sioux is reflected in his facial expression, passing judgment on a matter of great importance to his people. This is a photograph of Chief Rain in the face who was wounded in the battle and walked with a limp thereafter. Later in life, he served as a police officer in the Standing Rock Reservation. In an interview in the late 1890s, Rain said of the Battle of the Little Bighorn, we were better armed than the longswords. Their guns wouldn't shoot but once. We saved our bullets by knocking them with our war club. It was like killing sheep. We spared none. Not to be missed, episode 11 is the pivotal tale of the entire Westward experience, recipient of more stories and interpretations, and the turning point when victory became defeat and defeat led to the end of conflict. The Battle of the Little Bighorn and General George Armstrong Custer. <laughs>